Settled after morning tea now. For all of those who weren't at the recep uh, welcome reception last night or on the bus tour yesterday, my name is Lynn Thompson. I'm the State Library of Queensland My Language Representative and the 2012 My Language Conference Chairperson. Now we've just had an amazing keynote um, presentation from Michael and we're just about to start our second international keynote presentation. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Roy Burney Jr. and Jeff Edwards from the Cherokee Nation Education Services Group. Oseo uh, Nagad, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Roy Burney Jr. and this is Jeff Edwards. Uh, we flew from uh, uh, Oklahoma to come here from the United States and uh, we work for the Cherokee Nation and we work in the Education Services uh, Department and uh, we do language technology. And so uh, that, what that means is that we try to find innovative solutions to use our language in all sorts of digital media. And I'll let Jeff introduce himself real quick. And, uh, my name is Jeff Edwards and uh, I've worked for the Cherokee Nation for 10 years, uh, five years for our curriculum and development program, and then uh, five years with uh, language technology. So I guess we'll get started. All right, so we're gonna start off, uh, the first half of this is gonna be like a history lesson. And I'll let Jeff get into the uh, fun part about the technology. But it's, it's good to understand how the Cherokee language developed from its, the writing system of, of itself. So, uh, see, there's uh, the current location of the Cherokee Nation. It's in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And you can see that's the Cherokee syllabary above it. That's how a writing system looks. Some of the characters may look like English, but they don't sound like it. But we'll get to that in a bit later. Uh, the uh, Cherokees, uh, there's this old story about where we came from. Uh, we were originally based in the southeastern United States, uh, but there's, the story is that we came from an island south of the, uh, out in the ocean there in the Atlantic, and we rode a giant turtle to the continent, and that's where we settled in the southeastern uh, United States there. So what happened is when the, uh, when England, you know, everyone started coming to the, to the new world to, uh, you know, claimed the territory, the uh, Cherokee, uh, we were forced, uh, our land base started shrinking. Uh, this image here shows the uh, initial land base of the Cherokees, the blue outline, and this is again in the southeastern United States, that every so often we were forced to cede land to the uh, colonial powers that kept coming in. So our land base kept shrinking and shrinking, we thought it was in the part of Georgia and Tennessee and Alabama, this little bitty green area there. Uh, but during this time, you know, the uh, Europeans found the Cherokees very fascinating. And so, you know, the Cherokees, we decided to, uh, you know, become friends with a lot of these nations. So England is the first nation that we had a treaty with. And this image here is an engraving showing uh, the delegation of Cherokees that went to England in 17, I believe it's 62 or 61 or so. Uh, they called them the Three Kings. And, uh, that was just the, the name that the, the, the English gave them. But, uh, you know, they went to England. They caused a big stir. You know, no one had seen these very, you know, exotic type of, you know, tribal people before. Uh, and just, uh, I think it was last, uh, two months ago, the Cherokee Nation uh, celebrated the 250th anniversary of this visit. They actually sent some delegates to England to uh, commemorate the, uh, the, uh, the visit there. So... Uh, I want to show this is one of my friend's paintings that represents this visit just last month. <laughs> uh, you know, Jeff and I, we're not uh, engineers, we're not uh, technology, anything, we, we, we don't code, we don't program. We're actually artists, so we just kind of fell into this line of work, but this is one of my artist friend's paintings of that event. <laughs> uh, so we come to this. Sequoia is the man that, uh, Basically, he invented our writing system. It's a syllabic writing system, so each uh, glyph represents a sound. So here's how he would write his name, Sequoia. Uh, again, that, that's a portrait of him, which uh, actually no one knows what he looked like because no one recorded you know, how he looked when he was alive. No one did a portrait of him during that time. This is just kind of a guess what people think he looks like. But... Uh, it was around 18, well, he had worked on the writing system for quite a long time. Uh, he was a uh, soldier in the war there in the, uh, 
I guess the early 1800s or so, and the, he had seen the uh, the white settlers writing to each other, and he wondered, you know, what this was, and he called it talking leaves. You know, he seen people write it on paper and send it off, and he thought, well, the Cherokees we did our own writing system too, because we have thoughts and ideas, and this is a really great way to communicate. So, and uh, he spent about 15 or 16 years developing different versions of this. Initially, the Cherokees kind of thought it was kind of evil, kind of magic witchcraft, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. So at one point, uh, they burned down his house and said, you can't do this anymore. But he persisted. And so around 1821, he came up with this system here. And this is the handwritten syllabary by Sequoia himself. This is his handwriting. Uh, and you can see it's very uh, swirly, you know, just how it was in that time period of the 1800s. You know, people wrote with the, the pens and the quills and all this. <clears throat> well, what, what happened was, you know, the, the printing press, you know, was the, ma the mass communication method of the era. And uh, during the 1820s, you know, like I showed earlier, that map of our shrinking land base, we were still being, like, you know, crowded by the incoming settlers from Europe. So the Cherokees ceded more land and more land and more land. But it was decided that we needed to fight back against this any way we could. So the idea was to take Sequoia's writing system and adapt it to the uh, printing press. So this image here shows the evolution of how our language changed from that very you know, curvilineal form to a simplified version to the metal typeface. And if you've ever seen you know, these little typefaces, they're real tiny, so you can imagine it's kind of hard to carve that shape out into the metal that's why it was simplified. And here's a picture of the original printing press that was developed in the 1820s in the Cherokee Nation. This is currently in the uh, museum at Tahlequah, Oklahoma, next to our tribal uh, headquarters. And there's a picture of some of the, the little typefaces there. They're, it's pretty tiny. And at the bottom is one of the uh, original impressions of the uh, writing system as it was finally formalized. So again, it went from Sequoia's handwriting to this uh, really you know, harsh typeface. And again, I said some of it looks like English, but it, it doesn't sound like it. And here is the chart that shows uh, which sounds go with each syllable. So we have the vowels at the top, and then the rest of them are constant you know, vowel uh, combinations. So it's a, it, you know, like I said, it's a syllabary, so each uh, symbol makes a sound that goes with it. And I thought I'd throw this in here to kind of show you how it works. <laughs> Uh, this is the transliteration of koala. So you can see at the top is Cherokee, it's go -wa -la. So you know, that was a little fun demonstration of how the writing system works. <laughs> uh, this is the very first uh, printed instance of the Cherokee writing system. This is the first thing that was ever published in Cherokee. And it was in 1827. The, the American Board of Foreign Missionaries, you know, they were the... Uh, missionary, the main missionary group in the United States at the time. And uh, they partnered with Cherokee Nation to help pay for this printing press as part of it was for missionary work. So one of the first things that was, well, the first thing that was printed was the first five uh, verses from the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. And that led to the Cherokee Phoenix newspaper. It was the uh, very first uh, Native American newspaper and it was printed in English and in Cherokee. Uh, that came out in the, uh, February 1828. And uh, the idea of it was, again, was to, to give news to the Cherokee people, but it was also meant as more like a, uh, almost like a PR machine to say, hey, you know, we're, we're fighting this, people taking our, our land here, our home, we gotta get the word out. And the Phoenix actually uh, became international. There's subscribers all over the world, so they knew what was happening in the United States at this time. <coughs> uh, unfortunately, it didn't really work. Uh, the majority of the Cherokee Nation, as well as other tribes in the area, that we were forced to uh, move to the west. And we went to uh, Oklahoma, which was Indian territory at the time. Uh, there was a few holdouts, and uh, there's still there's a Cherokee tribe in North Carolina still. They're called the Eastern Band Cherokees, and so we still interact with them. But you know, most of the Cherokee people were moved to uh, present-day Oklahoma on the uh, Trail of Tears. So this this is a 
image showing the map of some of the routes that were taken. Uh, people either walked over the land or uh, through water routes, but you know, it was a very harsh movement and the a majority of the uh, people you know, were dying or sick. So it was this really tragic thing that occurred. But if you know history, uh, Cherokee history very, really well, you know, Cherokees always you know, come back. So when we arrived in uh, Indian Territory, uh, we established uh, schools and universities. And this image here is of, it's called Seminary Hall. It was one of the first uh, institutes of higher learning uh, west of the Mississippi River. Uh, we educated uh, women as well as the men, and the education was free for everyone up to age 21. It was one of the most progressive you know, areas in the United States at the time of, for education. <laughs> And uh, we continued printing, because what happened, you know, when the, uh, we were forced to move from our original homelands in the southeast, uh, the uh, colonial governments actually destroyed the printing press that was made. Uh, but when we were, uh, were settled in the Indian Territory in Oklahoma, uh, we reestablished presses. So we had many presses pop up after that. And so there was lots of material that was uh, printed. There's several books, you know, primers, there were Bibles, there were uh, newsletters, there was books of poetry, there were maps, you know, almanacs, all sorts of materials that were printed. Uh, and following this, you know, this goes up through the uh, Civil War, you know, we kept printing various things, you know, here's a hymnal. But during the Civil War, you know, we, again, were caught in the United States, the, the battle, and so a lot of the progress we built was torn apart. <laughs> and after that, we established printing presses again. And after, after the Civil War, we kind of slowed with the printing, but we kept at it. And then at the turn of the century, uh, you know, a little bit after that, you know, things like the telephone start coming out, you know, or I guess it was before that maybe. But, uh, you know, when the telephone became the new uh, communication technology, you know, someone said, hey, you know, we need a phone in Cherokee Nation. Uh, so the... Uh, Telephone company, this guy here named Ed Hicks, came to Cherokee Nation and said, uh, hey, well, we want to build a telephone line through your territory. And you know, again, like when te new technology comes out, you know, people are kind of reluctant to uh, you know, use it because you're kind of afraid of it. Uh, some of the people on the council were afraid of this phone. They're like, I don't know if we need this thing. So what they did is they did a, a test they built a phone line from uh, Tahlequah, which was the Cherokee Nation capital, to a town called Fort Smith, which was a military base just maybe 15 miles down the road or so. Uh, and they strung the telephone wire through the trees because there was like, really not a path going through there. And uh, they did this test. So one guy got on the uh, one end of the phone, and over the, the military base, they did the other uh, line. They picked it up, and they, you know, they talked to each other. And when the council saw this, they were like, well, that's great, we really need it. But the main reason why they did it is this is what they said, it talks in Cherokee. So that's the reason that you know, the council said, hey, we're gonna adopt a telephone. <laughs> and so you know, the, the next major advancement was radio. Uh, this is a picture of Will Rogers. You, know, you may have heard of him, the, the American actor. He was uh, Cherokee. And you know, during his era, he was pretty well known. He's world famous, and the you know, Cherokees claimed him as you know our own. This guy made it big, uh, and he was a big radio star as well as a film star. And uh, you know, he always kept close to home. Uh, so he had this program where he bought uh, radios for a lot of the Cherokee communities, and uh, you know, he would talk to them and let them you know, use it to to get their word out and all this. So the radio became a big part of you know Cherokee life. So in addition to that, you know, we're still, we were always using communication technologies at the time. Uh, this is a picture of a Cherokee typewriter. Uh, you can see, you know, it's kind of cumbersome because there are 85 characters you have to type with. So you can imagine doing shift and all this to type, but there's an image of that. Uh, here's an image of a letter from Washington, D.C. in 1917 to the Cherokee Nation using such a typewriter. And again, you know, it was, it was the official way of communication. And then the, the, if we jump forward a bit, uh, in the 70s, uh, 
we uh, needed, a, again, new technology were coming, so we worked with IBM to get the electric typewriter in the Cherokee. And so this is an image of the little typewriter ball. You know, you could put them in there and switch them out. Uh, there were a few thousands of these made, I believe, but they're kind of hard to find now these days. Uh, so going from a typewriter, uh, you know, computers were coming around this time in the 70s as well, the 1970s. Uh, if you're a typographer or familiar with fonts, you know of uh, Herman Zopf. Uh, if, if you don't know who he is, you probably use some of his fonts a lot. A lot of the fonts on your uh, computers are, were designed by this uh, man. He was a German typographer. So in the uh, late 70s, he was actually developing a Cherokee font. And this is an image from his book showing his sketches for a Cherokee font for a computer. Uh, as far as I know, I don't think it was ever actually made, but it kind of started paving the way for people to start developing Cherokee fonts. And this, you know, when, if you connect all the dots, you can actually trace the line from when the Cherokee Phoenix went overseas to Europe, you know, from the United States, to here, because the Cherokee language has always been a source of fascination uh, for people all over the world. They're like, hey, this is really interesting, this is great, so let's, you know, study this. So it's one of the most documented uh, travel you know, written languages in the world. So again, you know, computers were starting to be used, and like always, the Cherokees, we always wanted to use the latest technology to communicate in our language. Uh, like I said, the, the Zop font never quite made it, but uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, <laughs> this man named uh, Robin McLean worked with Al Webster to design the first uh, Cherokee font. Uh, this is an image of it. It was called White Path. And in Cherokee uh, philosophy, the, the term White Path is the path that you want to walk on. You want to be on the good path. You know, it's the White Path, the path of you know, light and truth. And that's why the, they decided to name it this. This was continuing our way of communication. And you need to communicate these ideas to everyone. Uh, that was followed by this font here. This is by uh, Joan Touze. She was a student at Yale University at the time. And uh, she had seen that you know, we had one font, and maybe she could help by making another one. So she got a grant to uh, design this font here. And she gave her work over to the Cherokee Nation. She donated it. And the Cherokee Nation took it and refined it a bit. And so this is a, the font that the Cherokee Nation released in around the year 2000 or so. Uh, yeah, the, 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 it was great. We still use it, actually. You know, some people still do hang on to this pretty strongly. But it was the first widely used Cherokee font on a computer. Uh, the, the problem with this, if, if you deal with languages a lot and type in your computers and all this, you know that it's important, just because Michael mentioned this in his presentation too, about it being in Unicode. Uh, the original Cherokee font was not you know, a Unicode font. It was basically a, the uh, glyphs were coded to uh, English character sets, you know, code points. So you, it was just a, it looked Cherokee, but the computer still read it as English. Uh, so with that, you know, the Cherokee Nation developed this typing system where the keys were mapped to these, you know, keys up here. So you had your uppercase and your lowercase, and you had to memorize where all this was at. So going back to Unicode, you know, uh, if you're not familiar with, I'll go with a, a quick overview. They basically encode, you know, uh, scripts into this database, they give each uh, a glyph a uh, code point, and so it's matched. So like, a, I don't know the code points exactly, but like a lowercase a has its own code point, and the uppercase a does. So every computer you know, knows, can differentiate which, each, what these characters are. Uh, and the great thing about it is that Cherokee is part of the system. Uh, how this happened, uh, some of you may know Michael Everson. Uh, if you don't, he does lots of great work of you know getting uh, scripts encoded into the Unicode system, uh, and he did he worked on the Cherokee application. This is about uh, 1995. He uh, contacted the Cherokee Nation and said, "Hey, I would like to to do this because again, like many people, he had he knew of the writing system in his history, and he thought it'd be great to encode this into Unicode." Uh, so he worked with Durbin Fielding and. Uh, 
Durban Feeling is the premier uh, Cherokee linguist. A lot of uh, the work that we're doing today is based off of his work. Uh, he's been working since the mid-70s. He's still going. He works in our office now, so we're like very pleased to work with him. But he and Michael uh, wrote up this proposal to get uh, the Cherokee syllabary uh, encoded into Unicode. <clears throat> and it took a few years. So by around, I guess, my, the year 2000 or so, it was actually accepted. Uh, but the issue was uh, no one really understood what this was uh, at the Cherokee Nation. And the Cherokee people, everyone just thought, you know, well, it's a, we have that old font that we use. That's not Unicode. Let's continue using that. So even though Cherokee wasn't coded at this point, it, didn't, it was a few years later until it actually was uh, adopted. Uh, and this image here is just shows a, uh, the Cherokee syllabary associated with the code points. It may be hard to read, but each you know, syllable has its own code point now. Uh, and then this is an early uh, font that we were designing that would, be, that would work better on a computer screen. Because if you do a lot of uh, font design, you know that you, know, you, have, you need to remove some of the uh, serifs on the glyphs so it, it's easily, be, easily readable on a screen. <coughs> but uh, we're going to move from that, and I'm going to let Jeff take over here. So Jeff gets to do the fun part and talk about all the, uh, the cool technology stuff for the computers. Yeah, we drew straws, and I drew the short one, so I get to do the cool stuff. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our immersion school and uh, the technologies that we're working on today. Um, in 2003, Cherokee Nation did a language survey, and the results of that survey were just, it was detrimental. Our language was dying. Um, it was dying quickly. And they determined that less than 10% of the fluent speakers were under the age of 40. And so we knew we had to do something if we were going to save our language. Um, up on the screen is Jalagi Junadelo Kwasti, and that is our Cherokee Immersion School. It's in the heart of Cherokee Nation in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And our school um, consists of about 90 students, um, grades three and four year old, all the way up to sixth grade. And the neat thing about our school is, is it's an immersion school. The minute these kids walk in the door, they speak nothing but Cherokee. Um, they don't hear any English outside other than in their homes um, because a lot of the parents of our students are not fluent speakers. But while they're at our school, it is uh, Cherokee 100% of the time. Well, the downfall of starting a Cherokee school is there is absolutely zero materials for to do this. So it's very, uh, it's very hard um, because nothing exists. You can't run to Walmart, get on Amazon.com and buy a book of Cherokee science you know, worksheets. They do not exist, so therefore you have to have people like me and Roy and Joseph um, and our curriculum development department to make this stuff. Um, what's up on the screen is really gross, but it's necessary. Um, this is a science of the digestive system. And um, what the school follows is the uh, Oklahoma Pass Objectives. So we follow every single um, rule that an English student is going to learn, except we teach them in Cherokee. So we develop this stuff. Um, this right here, very important to know the solar system. Um, also, you know, you have to learn the states. Um, some states uh, were actually, we had names for them in Cherokee, and other names we just simply transliterated and came up with the name that way. And again, like I said, you know, all this stuff you're going to learn in an English school, um, and we want our kids to be smarter. So, um, and this is how our school started. Um, the typical pen and paper, um, very boring. Um, our students, um, you know, uh, are seeing their friends that have all these uh, gadgets and computers and all that stuff. So we realized our department, uh, language technology, which consists of three guys, me and Roy and Joseph, um, we had to do something to make school fun for these kids. So what we did was, was uh, we realized that uh, Mac computers had supported the Cherokee font since 2003. So naturally, um, it was already on there. So we decided that from second grade all the way up to sixth grade, every single child is provided a Macintosh computer. Um, and as you can see, they're really happy. And um, this is the first day um, 
uh, right here on the left, that they received their computers and they are really excited. Um, and uh, it's kind of hard to see the black and white keyboard cover, but we had to teach these children how to type. And so that is a keyboard overlay um, and it's all in the Cherokee and basically that teaches the child uh, what, you know, what key to hit to get that specific syllabary character. So a lot had to go into this to make this happen. Um, and like Michael was saying earlier, our elders, um, I hate to say that they fought us, but they weren't very pleased with us when we started this until this right here happened. They seen the children using it and instantly, I mean, literally instantly they were on board with it. Um, and what we have here is a video chat with one of our elders that's in another part of the community interacting with one of our immersion students. And when we, we always claim we use our children at immersion, we make them sign things so we can abuse them like this. And it worked really well here because uh, um, it got our elders on board. And uh, you know, so you do what you gotta do. Um, and uh, so now our elders are on board, which makes it way greater when we have the support. Um, here's just some pictures of the students in school. Um, the great thing about this is, is they're able to do email, they're able to search the web, and they're able to do it in their own language. Um, we're competing with English, and that is a tough language to compete with, um, in case you don't know, um, because everything is in English. And so we realized that we had to do something to get these kids to want to learn their language. And children today, they are raised on technology. They have cell phones, they have computers. Everything about their lives is driven by technology. We are um, geeks and nerds and we love technology. So it worked really well um, getting them what they needed. Again, that's just another picture of the keyboard cover we had to develop to teach them how to type. And um, the, the thing about the school was, is we have about 90 students. Um, but you know, when you go to school with these same people from when you're in kindergarten up until sixth grade, you know, it's kind of boring because you know these people and the kids started feeling really alienated. They felt like they were the only ones in the world um, that were basically going through this program. So we decided uh, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Nation in uh, Cherokee, North Carolina, they have an immersion school. And so we linked these two schools up to where the students can video chat, um, they can email, um, you know, they can text, they can do all these things with this other school. And we're going to play you a little clip here in the small picture. Um, up in the uh, left-hand corner is our school. The bigger picture is the school in the Eastern Band. And what they're doing is they're teaching these children a traditional song. So I'll go ahead and play the clip. <laughs> And so um, me and Roy actually just went to North Carolina and we will tell you it's a very long drive. Um, it's about 900 miles one way. Um, by linking these schools together, distance was not a factor. Um, they could get online at any time and communicate with each other, make new friends, maybe some new enemies, and you know, pick up some ladies and all that stuff. And uh, they didn't have to drive to Cherokee, North Carolina. You know, they were just right there on the computer. And as you can see, um, like Roy talked about, the Cherokees have always adopted technology. And what we're getting ready to get into is the things that we have done um, in technology to keep this alive. Um, not all the companies we're about to talk to, um, they allowed us to come to their headquarters and they allowed us to present to them and then they politely told us no. And there's nothing wrong with that um, because um, like Michael was saying earlier, by having a Cherokee version of Windows, they're not gonna sell 200,000, a million copies. If they sell a thousand, they might be doing good. So it's totally understandable. So you just simply have to be persistent. I'm not picking on my say no, um, but I'm just saying that, you know, um, they will tell you no and it's okay. You just have to stay after them and uh, no is not in your vocabulary. And so um, what we did was um, we went out to all these companies and uh, 
the ones that told us no, we decided we kind of made a pact because our office is very small, uh, three guys and now four with our new translator. And we decided all of them was going to represent us. Um, we was not going to be satisfied. It was our mission that we would be represented. And so um, we started out with Apple. That was probably our biggest accomplishment. Um, what you're seeing on the screen there is an Apple iPhone. And when this came out um, with the release of uh, iOS 4.2, instantly 120 million devices had the capabilities to text and email in the Cherokee language. Um, you can see the keyboard there. Um, the bottom of the keyboard is our vowels and everything else is the uh, consonants to the keyboard. Um, and people ask us uh, all the time, how did this happen? And we respond, um, we don't know. We have no idea how to tell you how this really happened. One day we were in our office and Roy thought it would be cool to text in Cherokee and that's what got it started. Um, and then our immersion school kicked in and all these kids at the school had phones, but they were texting in English. And so we took it up on ourselves to stay after Apple. Um, Apple's a very private company to work with. So basically three years without communication. One day we get a phone call and it was a uh, insider guy. We can't say his name. He said, you might want to download this. And that was all he could tell us. So Cherokee is on the iPhone. Um, very interesting times, very stressful. Um, the cool thing about Cherokee being on the iPhone um, as you see to your left, uh, you're able to name folders in Cherokee. The middle is actually the contacts. That's all of our students at our immersion program. And the last picture is actually an ebook that we were able to produce for the children in Cherokee. Um, this is always our favorite picture. Um, this is when we incorporated the uh, iPhone into the school. And you can look really closely. Her feet are not touching the ground. She is very excited to have this device. And uh, so um, we love to include that one. Um, and again, here's just some more. Uh, this, this kid is sending a message um, in Cherokee, um, probably to another student. They like to do that. And the great thing about Apple was once we got on the iPhone, well, naturally, we went on the iPad. Um, we're not satisfied. And that's, that's kind of the way you have to think about things. What else can I get from you? And so, um, you know, so we, um, we weren't happy. We wanted on the iPad next. So we, again, don't know how it happened, but it did. And all of a sudden, an update came out, and we were represented on the iPad as well. And uh, we, of course, were the first Native American language to be represented. So this was very, you know, big honor to uh, have this happen, you know. Um, here's just some of our students. Again, we use our children to our advantage. This is the pictures we send to Apple to say, look at our children. They're smiling and, and uh, we abuse them in every way. And they're always willing to cooperate. So um, if you're trying to do this, use your children. Um, and the neat thing about it was, was we were able to make, this is a story about Andy Payne. Um, he ran a transcontinental race. Uh, he was Cherokee. And I believe in 1926, I think is when it was. And uh, he won. He ran across America. And so we're able to do these type of stories and put these on our books for our children to read about uh, prominent Cherokees. Um, here's another book illustrated by Roy. Um, it's a traditional story as well. And uh, this girl here, we have a speakers consortium meeting once a month. And this was only for the elders to attend. And one day, um, they decided to let this, uh, these children of our immersion school attend as well. And she actually won an iPad. And I don't know if they were, <laughs> maybe they wish she didn't come. Because she won the iPad. So she got a free iPad that day. Um, out of the raffle. Uh, we always like to show this picture. It's always neat to be included. Um, we're um, right above Chinese. And um, um, the crazy thing about Cherokee being on the iPhone and iPad is depending on who you ask will determine how many fluent speakers we have. Um, it's anywhere from 2,000 to 10,000. And if we're talking to big companies, we have 100,000. So, you know, we always elaborate that really bigly. Um, but, you know, um, you do what you got to do. 
But um, there's languages out there that have millions and millions of fluent speakers that are not on this. So we are very, very honored to be uh, included in this small list of 42 languages that we are, in fact, one that is uh, represented. Um, here's just a screenshot of an iPad. It's very similar to the uh, iPhone, the same typing method with the valves and the consonant rows. And what's really cool about technology and dealing with Cherokee is Cherokee is not updated uh, on any level. And so these words constantly have to be invented. And I don't know if anyone can guess what this is depicting here. Um, it's depicting email. And uh, it's basically anagaligi goweli, lightning paper. Um, that's the cool thing about translating you can say whatever you want, and they just have to accept what it is. And so that's our translation for email is lightning paper. It's very fast. Um, our next big company we started working with was Facebook. Um, we contacted them. They basically gave us admin rights, and we started translating. And I guess uh, I think at last time Facebook was about 75% complete on translation. Somewhere around in there? We'll say 75%. It sounds good. And, um, you know, with Facebook, people are able to post in their native language, send messages, all that stuff. Um, with Wikipedia, again, we have our own Wikipedia page. Um, there's, it's growing daily um, with the articles that's up there. And it's kind of a great thing because now our children are able to go there and search Wikipedia for articles for school and stuff like that. Um, this is our blogs. Our kids at our school have blogs. Um, I'm not fluent in Cherokee. Roy isn't, so we can't tell you what this says. Um, and maybe we don't want to know. I don't know, but they love to post in their blogs. That's a part of homework. And there's just more blogs where our children are posting at school, and the, the teachers have all made this a requirement now, so it's a part of their homework now. So it's really neat to get them to... Uh, um, to do this. Um, the next company we went with was Google. Um, when we went to Google, we talked to them about getting the Google homepage translated into Cherokee so we would have a search engine for our kids at school to use in Cherokee. And of course, like I said, we always love to circle um, where we are in the list there, and you can see it, it's real big and red, that Cherokee is in fact supported with Google. And uh, here is a picture, a screenshot of Google's homepage that's translated in Cherokee. Google did a really neat thing for us. Um, they developed that keyboard. It was a virtual keyboard to where even if you did not have Cherokee installed on your computer, you could still use this virtual keyboard. So that was really nice of them to do this. And again, this is just the Google. Uh, you know, you can see there Google and Jalagi underneath it. That means Cherokee. So that's what it, the Google homepage looks like for the search. Um, again, there's just more with Google. And uh, there's us doing a search of Jalagi. Um, I can't see, I forgot my glasses, so I think that's 7,320,000 if you search the term Jalagi on Google today. And it might have doubled by now. I'm not sure this is a fairly old screenshot. Um, we're also able to use Google Maps. Um, what we're showing here is uh, the little greenhouses are prominent Cherokee communities. So we're slowly working with them on that to get our uh, Google Maps so that the children can go and search for different areas of different communities as well. So Google Maps is really popular with the kids. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is what it looks like when your language is not supported on a device. You have squares, and uh, it's hard to type when you have squares. And what this is, is this is a Google, uh, I think it's a Droid 2. And we were going to meet with Google. And um, so we decided to be bold, and we rooted our Droid and installed the font on it, and we went and took this device to Google and presented it to them. It's not illegal to do what we did, but companies usually frown on this. And so we were really bold in doing this and cocky, I guess you could say. And uh, we took this device to Google and their engineers and said, we were able to do it, so we know you can. And so we um, rooted a Droid, and then we also took it a step further, and we rooted the Droid X, uh, Zoom tablet and took that with us as well. So hopefully in about a year and a half, uh, Android operating systems is also going to uh, 
um, we're going to be able to have Cherokee on those as well. So we're just trying to take over the world, apparently. Um, and uh, this is our uh, Macintosh uh, locale. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as you can see, the dates and all that stuff there are all in Cherokee. Um, so the, again, you know, the children are able to use this device in their native language. Um, Roy included this. We thought it was really neat. That's Apple TV. Um, it also, we didn't realize it recognized Cherokee, but it does, so we had to throw it in there. And uh, now we get to where we're working with Michael. Um, we actually started out working with uh, Microsoft, and all we wanted from Microsoft was a keyboard, and Michael developed that for us, and it was a, one of the greatest keyboards that ever existed for Cherokee people. Um, no one has agreed on a keyboard up to this point, and now they all agree that this is the keyboard. So thank you, Michael, very much. Very, very much. Um, what happened was, was I don't know, um, you know, you're either a PC person or a Mac person, and you're gonna hate the other guy that you're not, and that's okay. But what happened was, was in our area, it's a fairly poverty-stricken area, and I don't know if you've priced a MacBook compared to a PC, but there's a big difference in price, extremely different. You can get an ebook for, uh, um, you know, for $200 at Walmart compared to a MacBook at $1,100. So we knew we had to do something um, to get everyday people being able to afford these devices with their language. So we contacted Microsoft. It started out as a keyboard project. Uh, Michael completed that and they said, well, how about we go ahead and localize Windows 8? So that's what you see there on the screen with the date and the font there of being uh, the 16 there by the clock. Um, and so we uh, began localizing. Well, then Microsoft approached us and said, how about we just go ahead and you do the whole operating system? Um, that consisted of over 100,000 words that did not exist. Maybe out of the 100,000, um, I want to safely say 100 existed. And so we had a lot of words to invent. Um, but, you know, we knew this was important. And so we did not even... Uh, we didn't even think nothing about it when we agreed to it. Uh, we have about eight to 10 translators that work with us, me and Roy and Joseph, and that's it. So um, this is the part where we always say, you don't need a big department um, to do these things. You just have to be willing to try. You're gonna fail and that's okay because you just get back on the horse and try again. Um, and this is just some screenshots of where the keyboard layout is available for Cherokee Nation on Windows 8. And again, another keyboard preview, very crisp and beautiful. And uh, we always like this font. Our font for Windows is called Gadugi. And Cherokee, that means working together. Um, Cherokees are very community oriented. Our license plates on our cars say Gadugi. We work together. And that's the only way we're going to survive is by working together. Um, this is, uh, Roy showed you earlier the paper copy of the Cherokee Phoenix. It still exists today, except it's in uh, uh, digital format on the internet as opposed to, and they still print it in paper as well. But um, we always um, stress to people at this point several things. Number one, like Roy said earlier, we are not programmers. We're not, uh, you know, we're not linguists. We're not any of those things. We're just guys that um, we don't know if we're too dumb to not say no. And we don't know, but we it doesn't matter. We just try. And uh, so you don't have to have big degrees. We're artists. And so artists are known to be lazy at times. So, you know, so we get it done. Um, and uh, it's very important that you realize that anybody can do this. You don't have to be, um, uh, you know, you don't have to be some big important person to get Microsoft or to get Mac or any of these companies to acknowledge you. You just simply have to approach them sometimes many times, but eventually they're going to listen to you. It's very important. Technology, um, another thing we always iterate, and we always get a question about it, so we decided to include it in the presentation so we won't get a question about it. Technology is only a tool. If I had to choose between all the technology in the world and one fluent speaker, I'm gonna pick that speaker every time. That technology cannot save your language. It can promote it, 
It can do great things for you, but you absolutely have to have those fluent speakers. So we are in no way, fashion, or form saying technology will save your language because it will not. If you rely on that, you will lose your language, guaranteed. You cannot replace your uh, fluent speakers. And of course, this picture here, we always show this one at the end. This is why we do what we do. This is our kids. These are uh, me and Roy and Joseph. We have approximately 90 children now. We've adopted all these kids, and this is why we work, and this is why we get up every morning and go to work. And uh, when we provide them with something cool, they're very grateful, and then we have to go back and top that. So this is why we do what we do. And uh, that is the end. Um, I guess questions? Anyone? Thank you. I've got one thing to say. You just want to say, wow. <laughs> and how persistent. Never say no. Always That's have right. to keep that in my mind. So we've probably got about five minutes. If anyone has um, a question that they would like to ask Roy or Jeff. Before we go on to our next presentation. Rolly down the front. What other media are there like TV and so on in charity? Uh, there's... There's not a whole lot. Most of it is online based, but the uh, the Cherokee Tribal uh, Headquarters uh, we have they call it Cherokee TV. It's a closed uh, yeah, just in the inside the building. They they show uh, videos because we also make uh, Cherokee language animations for the school. So for the kids, they show that and they show a newscast and they show some of the uh, the Cherokee Nation runs a high school called Sequoia High School and they do some of the basketball games and events in Cherokee and they broadcast that inside the uh, the building. My other question was, has it ever been considered to go away from the traditional Cherokee orthographic, orthographic system and simply use Roman? Because I think Navajo is written in Roman language, right? Yeah. 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 Not, not really. Uh, people, we get that we get that question a lot. We went to a uh, typography conference last summer in uh, New Orleans called TypeCon, and uh, one of the people in the audience asked, "Well, why do you just use the uh, Latin orthography?" And uh, the the reason is that uh, you know uh, there's a lot of Cherokees uh, that are still around, but there's not a lot of fluent speakers compared to the uh, total population. And the writing system itself is something that everyone has ingrained as, into ourselves. Like that's that's our language, and that yeah, you know, we're going to use that over anything that we can. And uh, there has been some movement to to make uh, new fonts based on that original writing system that I showed, the handwriting version, because this uh, typeface was modified, and some of it does look like English, and some people don't like that. They're like, we need something that's very distinctly ours. Uh, but there's some back and forth, you know, between that. In terms of the preservation of the language, um, does the Cherokee Nation um, have one or two radios where you have your music? Yeah. In, because that will be, you know, I guess a great element of uh, people sharing um, the audio uh -huh. and learning. Particularly with trying to invent new words. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Cherokee Nation has its own radio show called the Cherokee Voices and Cherokee Sounds. It's broadcast the, the, on the local radio station there. Uh, and also, once a, uh, his name is Dennis Sixkiller. He does interviews, he has songs, he goes out, and it's like an hour long show. And at the end of it, every week, they uh, podcast it. So they put it in the iTunes. Uh, and podcasting section, and it's also on the Cherokee Nation website as a download. So you can download it, you can stream it, you can, you, so if you miss it, you can find it. So the radio show is a big source of uh, Cherokee language. A lot of people use that to learn the language because you can listen to it over and over and over. Yeah, but the, the radio show is pretty popular. I just want to ask, if the children are learning it at school, have you found any response from home? Yeah, the, uh, like Jeff mentioned, you know, there's only like 90 some odd children that go to the school. Uh, so the, the families that have their children in there are doing pretty uh, well about learning the language. Uh, you know, like it's, it's common for a lot of languages, you know, my parents speak the language, but my generation doesn't. So it's my generation that has the kids in the school. So there's this 
we're, the people in the center were being caught up between the young kids learning it and the elders that are learning it. And uh, you know, the school is very popular. Like I said there's a lot of kids, there's about 90 in it, but uh, those kids have friends and they go out and they're, everyone's like learning from each other now. And with the language being on things like in the iPhone and the laptops and, this, and the kids like this stuff. And so for them, it's like a source of pride to be able to use it in the language. And uh, that learning, like I said, is spreading to everyone. Uh, one of the coolest things about it was uh, when uh, it came out for the, the phone and the iPods and all this, uh, a lot of our elders uh, thought, you know, you know, that's not for them. They're like, oh, I'm not going to use this. This is for the kids. But now we have a lot of uh, elders that actually go out and buy iPads and iPhones and stuff because they can communicate with their grandchildren. And though uh, like I said, everyone is starting to really learn it. It's, it's personally for me, uh, you know, I'm very passionate about learning the language, but I did not use the language every day until I got a device where I get text in it every day. So I actually use the language every day since, and that's like two or three years ago now, and I use it every day. And I'm not unique in that situation because it's spreading to other devices too, so other people are using it as much as possible. It was a really interesting um, presentation. I think you just touched on part of my question, which is about the older generation and the new generation, and obviously you're focusing around children in the school and, and technology to bring that forward. How are you addressing the gaps that might be there or bridging the gaps between um, older members of the community who may not want to be using the internet technology and therefore may not also be sharing their stories or still passing on their knowledge? Yeah, well, that is a, a issue because uh, we had initially when we started doing this too, we did community presentations. We'd go out to the various communities and say, we have this plan and we want basically your blessing for us to go do this. Uh, we got a lot of resistance at first, especially showing, we had to modify the typeface some to work on the screen. They're like, you're changing our language, it doesn't look the same, you know, but it, we're just modifying it. But the thing is, you know, a lot of the older generation, like my father doesn't use any of this. I mean, this is what I do for a living now, but he doesn't have a, a device like this. But he still sees the value in it, and he'll help me if I need translations or something. And I said that's a common experience for people of my generation. Our parents can speak it, and they help us, but some of them don't use it. There are holdouts. And uh, there were some people that were afraid that uh, once we got our language onto uh, devices like this that were connected to the internet, that a lot of uh, traditions that should remain inside would get out, you know, especially uh, like shirky medicine and this type of stuff. Uh, they were really concerned about this, but uh, our other colleague who's not here, Joseph Erb, makes this good analogy. He says that, you know, in English, you can go to the internet and you can learn all this medical stuff, but there's no one that's become a doctor just by having an iPhone, you know, or something like that. So the idea is, like, you're not going to become a cherokee medicine man just by having these devices. You still got to go through the process of learning with an elder to get to that point. But again, there are people that do have some concerns about that. But, you know, it's, 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 very, it's a very interesting back and forth trying to get people to uh, you know, accept these devices. We don't ask them to use it, just kind of accept it's a new way of communication. It's, like Jeff said, it's a tool for the language, it's not gonna you know, save it. That's, that's really good and clear. So just quickly adding on to that, have you actually brought any of the elders into your classes to have that interaction and, and to see if that's actually changed some of those thinkings? Yeah. Uh, one of our uh, speakers, well, Bonnie is one that, Bonnie, uh, she's a speaker. She didn't, she just like couldn't stand, you know, using the computer. She uses a lot and she'll actually do video chatting with it and stuff now too. So the attitudes are changing. Uh, I would say, that I think that the strongest factor is, you know, like a lot of them, they see their grandchildren. She's got a grandchild in the school. And so she sees him, you know, using this stuff. And I said, that's common amongst a lot of the elders. They see their kids using it. And that changes their mind pretty fast when they see a, a young child using the language. We're probably going to have to leave it there because we've got another wonderful presentation behind. But if everyone could join me in thanking uh, Jeff and Roy. Um, I also just want, want to mention too, uh, this is their first trips to Australia. And I know we're really, really proud and happy to, to have you here. So thanks very much. <laughs>